Welcome to the Series A list with Rain Ventures, the live webcast where we'll be introducing you to some of the top founders and early stage VCs in the world. I'm Erica Dagden Minahan, and I'm here with my lovely co host and Rain Ventures co founder, Monique Idlet Mosley, every month to feature entrepreneurs and investors that have built amazing businesses and are generous enough to share their stories with us. Venture capital has long been a closed system and most startup founders are unsure how or if venture capital can be a tool to help them grow their businesses. Today, we'll be pulling back the curtain on early stage venture capital, introducing you to a top founder in the space and answering the big question, what does it take to get to Series A? So Monique and I are excited to welcome our next guest, biotech founder and tech innovator, Nina Tandon. Nina is the founder of Epibone, a revolutionary biotech company. So Nina, welcome. And before we get started, I just want to remind everybody that we're really excited to take your questions at the end. Please add any questions that you have for Nina to the chat or Q&A tab. And if you're in the chat, please say hi and let us know where you're tuning in from. Yay. Can we talk about the fact that you said biotech founder and we're looking at Nina? I mean, can we just like applaud that, especially during <laughs> Women's Month, right? Like I, I would that. love, to, I would be interested in knowing the stats of like women who are even in biotech. I'm just curious. Well, actually, you know, I, and don't quote me on this because I think it was something I, I read maybe from Ernst & Young, but I think that biotech has more something like 16% um, mm -hmm. women in C-level positions. Um, it's so it's, but don't quote me on that number, but it is one of the sectors that does have more female representation than other, other, other tech sectors. Um, still not, not 50% or 51, <laughs> which would be nice to see. Um, but it's definitely a field that is um, making progress. Yeah. That's amazing. So I'd love for you, you know, I've had the pleasure of like knowing you for a few years and, you know, being part of the EpiBone journey. Um, but I'd love for you to talk to the audience a little bit about, you know, what EpiBone is, what your company does and what inspired you to start this amazing business. Wow. Um, well, I definitely have drunk the Kool-Aid for regenerative medicine. I've been in this field working on this project in some way, shape or form for close to 20 years. Um, so it is very much my life's work. And what we do at Epibone is we combine two types of technologies that hadn't really been combined before. The first is digital fabrication. So you've probably all heard of 3D printing. Um, there's a whole other side of digital fabrication that includes 3D carving, <laughs> so uh, we use both, and um, and then stem cells, which is you know we all started out our at our lives as one cell big, and and those stem cells that eventually differentiated into all the different parts of our body, um, there are still stem cells all over our bodies that repair ourselves every day. Um, so what happens if you you know get injured to a degree that your body can't repair itself? We just take those stem cells and we engineer them into living body replacements using anatomical precision that we can create from digital fabrication. So we really are making what I like to think of as the, uh, the one-stop body shop of the future. So amazing. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> My son last summer, right before COVID actually, so maybe last mm -hmm. spring, my son had stem cell knee surgery. Oh, yep. Mm -hmm. So how, how similar or not is, is the, the two? I, I hesitate to ask you how your son's doing um, because, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, on the one hand, we have the um, medical device industry, which, which basically says, hey, do you need a new knee? Let's just amputate your knee and put in a new big metal one. And a lot of people don't want to do that, but yet a million people per year do. <laughs> and so in order to avoid doing that, um, we've seen stem cell therapies pop up and almost everyone probably on this call knows someone who's gotten one like your son. And um, what happens there is that stem cells are often injected, I'm guessing, injected. And 
they not a whole lot can go wrong with that, but oftentimes not a whole lot can go right either because stem cells are the ingredient to make new cartilage, make new bone, make new tendons and ligaments. But if they're not directed, they don't know what to do necessarily in the body. So there is some evidence that they can stimulate endogenous, what we call endogenous repair, but unfortunately they don't often really do that much. They're not going to harm him, but the likelihood that they'll really be that silver bullet is, 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 um, you know, it's, I wish I could say they worked better. The reason why we're doing what we're doing is that they don't do enough. And um, so what we do is we take those stem cells and we copy nature's playbook of what is it like for a stem cell inside the body? What is it like inside a bone or a piece of cartilage? And we mimic the environment that those cells would experience in the body with controlled oxygen, uh, nutrients, um, and mechanical forces. So we exercise those cells and turn them into tissues. It takes us about three to four weeks before we put it in the body. So by the time those stem cells are in the body, they're not stem cells anymore. They're what we call osteoblasts in a bone, chondrocytes in cartilage. We're actually putting those tissues in because the cells aren't enough. But luckily the cells don't harm. So what that means is that there's tons of safety data out there for the FDA. We know that it's a low risk cell type, but we're looking for the efficacy as well. That's so amazing. let's stay in touch about your son. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I'd love to see uh, him get some EpiBone parts. <laughs> that would be exciting. So amazing company, amazing technology, you know, would love to get a little bit on sort of your story, um, you know, your background as a scientist and, you know, what um, encouraged you to take the leap into becoming an entrepreneur? Well, you know, I ended up, I started in a field that you wouldn't think would lead me to biomedical engineering. Um, and it's one in which I, there were very few women actually. So I started out as an electrical engineer. I was a computer programmer building circuits. I, I was really into what's called embedded systems. So these are like little robots that you can program. And um, I loved the idea of building interactive technologies. Um, but I started working in telecom. I was like programming um, voice systems for voice over IP and started taking night classes in physiology. I just somehow really wanted to have this urge that I, I couldn't neglect. Um, so I ended up applying to go to graduate school after a couple of years of working as a software programmer. And, um, you know, I started learning things like, you know, DNA and how much it looked like a hard drive. This was before you know, we really realized how strong that analogy goes. Um, and um, so that really inspired me to want to go to MIT. They had a program called bioelectrical engineering. So I was actually an electrical engineering student in my PhD starting out, um, studying the electrical signals of wound healing, of cardiac development, how to use the body's natural energy fields to, um, to stimulate healing. So that was really my entree into biomedical engineering. The entrepreneurship story, I mean, depends where you start the clock. Um, I was definitely an entrepreneur as a child. I think a lot of entrepreneurs were. In my case, my sisters and I had our version of the Roosevelt Island Babysitters Club. You know, did you want one tandem, two tandems, three tandems? Are you having a party? That kind of thing, you know? Um, and so I definitely always liked running a business. You know, in my case, my mom did biz dev. Anytime she'd see a mom, pushing a shopping cart, say I have three teenage daughters. Um, but I think you're asking me about this entrepreneurial story. So I'd say the real aha moment that I wanted to be in, that I knew I wanted to be involved in an academic startup was working at McKinsey. So, you know, it was a couple years after my PhD, I had taken a job at McKinsey as a pharma med device consultant and loved seeing the 30,000 foot view of what it was like for these publicly traded company CEOs to be struggling with big decisions, really humanized and normalized that process for me. And I noticed that whenever we were looking in, in sort of M&A type work, there were always these academic startups that were kind of, you know, in this funnel of, of companies that they were looking at. And I thought to myself, there was the patent cliff. This was a big thing um, in the uh, early, you know, in around 2010, a lot of companies were worried about the big drugs coming off patent and trying to think about how to boost their pipelines and looking to companies spinning out of academia to do so. And I thought to myself, I wanna be 
part of that story. Um, so I ended up coming back to academia with the intention to eventually spin out some of the work we'd been working on in the lab. And um, that was in 2011. We spun EpiBone out three years later after incubating it in the in the in the university with the help of Columbia Business School, I might add. So um, when I came back to academia, I didn't come back just as a postdoc. My PhD advisor sponsored my executive MBA. I know you're a graduate of that program too. The EMBA program at Columbia was a huge part of EpiBone's launch. All the, uh, so many of my professors, executives and residents and classmates, <laughs> honestly, helped launch this business. It's been a real labor of love and um, very much, uh, you know, a product of the, the ecosystem that I think Columbia has taken quite, quite a bit of care to cultivate. I, I was reading, um, I didn't get to finish the article, but I was reading some, something that was written about EpiBone about getting ready to start the trials in 2019, part one of them. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm curious to know, like, how did COVID, because a lot of founders are dealing with this, right? Um, and I, I don't think we can talk about it enough. Um, but how, how did COVID impact your, your studies? And then how, how were you able to pivot and kind of keep moving along? No, thank you for that. You know, COVID has affected everybody. And it's been, you know, a struggle for us in our individual lives, as well as, you know, in the midst of the entire world and just, you know, our, it's been a struggle for a lot of us. And, you know, we got approved in 2019 by the FDA to start human clinical trials, but clinical trials take place in hospitals. And so then it takes a little bit of time, even in the best of circumstances, to take that FDA approval and fold it into a hospital approval, which is what's called an IRB, Investigational um, Review Board, I believe they, you know, that stands for, <laughs> but basically to be able to run your clinical trial in that hospital. And um, that process often takes, if you're going for top tier medical institutions, and of course we are, and um, it usually takes six to eight months. But in our case, it's taken more like 18 months, um, you know, so that has been a delay. And the two main sources of the delay were the moratorium on elective surgeries, because our product is delivered via surgery, and the um, deprioritization of in these investigational review boards of any non-COVID related trial. Now, how did we weather that? Um, and, I, and at this point, I mean, I do need to credit that this is a team effort. Okay, um, the initial panic that set in of, okay, what does this mean? It, do we cancel our clinical trial? I mean, we asked some pretty deep questions. We had to draw straws to be able to say, how long do you think this is gonna last? How long do you think this is gonna last? And make decisions. So what happened for us was Blake, um, our amazing chief of staff, who is- Hey a Blake, he's on here too. <laughs> yeah, he's on here too. And I won't make him talk unless- Hi he Blake. Hi Blake. <laughs> But I am blessed to work with my partner in crime. Um, you gotta stay on, Blake. <laughs> oh, he is he's the best. So he is our chief of staff. And um, you know, very much the, the two of us are like one person. Um, but he where he really attacked was to secure us essential business status and get us a PPP loan. And he applied, I believe, in the first couple hours because he was so well. Um, coordinated with our team at um, JP Morgan that we were able to apply within hours. So what we had once we received those funds was essential business status and cash buffer. And I should mention that we'd closed on a series seed financing only one month prior to um, the state of emergency being declared. So what this meant was we could take a breath. We could say, let's be thoughtful. Let's sit with this and let's make some strategic decisions, but without the kind of panic attack type of mentality that might lead us to make some rash decisions. So we didn't, we didn't end up furloughing a single person. We ended up re-assigning um, tasks to folks. Um, I, 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 don't, I wanted nothing more than be, to be able to say to my team, the world out there is scary, but your jobs are safe. Um, and um, we postponed 
raises, but we kept all the jobs. And we said, um, you know, let's let's evaluate the risk. We sort of made a matrix of what are the what are the key sources of risk for each parts of our pipeline. The clinical trial I already described. We had that moratorium on elective surgeries, and we had um, you know the deprioritization de de of non-COVID trials. But what about our cartilage work? Now our cartilage work was about to be implanted into horses, and so we thought, well. If those horses are implanted, once they're implanted, then they're unlikely to be affected by COVID delays because once a project is in place, it's in place. But, oh gosh, Colorado is a little bit far, isn't it? Let's find a way to bring that in state. So we um, ended up we realizing this is kind of silly, but you know, Cornell, which is, you know, arguably the world's best vet school is actually in state. Um, do we need to fly to Colorado? Can we just drive the grafts up to, to Cornell? So we did move that in state. When we thought about our clinical trial, um, we also said let's onboard sites that are geographically dispersed because we had a prediction that this COVID would play out differently in California versus Texas versus Ohio and New York. That was a sane choice and I'm very happy we did that. Um, and then we had another dog study that we, we had predicted wouldn't be affected very much because it was a small enough study. So we basically just went through our pipeline and our list of projects and, and evaluated the risks and mitigated those risks. And um, having that PPP funding gave us, I think, the ability to stay centered through a very turbulent time. And um, you know, now we've gotten our, our IRBs approved at Cleveland Clinic and UT San Antonio. We are starting, we're evaluating a, a queue of patients. So we're starting to see that COVID is, is hopefully gonna be in our rear view mirror soon. I'm really glad we were able to stay sane because that initial set of, that initial panic, it's very tempting to give into that and make pretty drastic decisions. But um, we luckily didn't have to do that. So I have to give a shout out to Blake who helped us get that PPP loan, as well as Sue Crinian. If you don't know who she is, she's in, she was a really big force behind, um, or, or is, she leads the life sciences practice for JP Morgan and um, is a, a, a really good member of the ecosystem there too, looking out for her companies. Well, it's so oh. great to hear a story of PPP money, you know, going to really like save such a vital business and to allow you to, you know, operate in the way that you wanted to. Sorry, Monique, you were saying something? No, what I was just going to say to kind of like summarize it for our audience is that you were able as a founder to not respond emotionally. You were able to take a step back and strategize and mm -hmm. in, in order to not make rash decisions. You you and your team found resources out there um, and then you executed the resources to protect the team. So I think that those are all great, you know, that's great advice. Thank you. Yeah, Thank it's you. a fantastic example of leadership. So, right. <laughs> um, you know, one of the things I know our audience is really excited to hear about is, you know, sort of your initial journey to sort of doing your first raise of capital from outside investors. And, you know, we very rarely get to hear from folks who are in biotech and sort of other less traditional tech spaces. So would love to know a little bit more about the unique challenges you faced as a biotech uh, founder and, you know, what your story was like. Well, you know, having come from a, a software background myself, I, I definitely have jealousy for those types of founders who are in a space where they can spend a weekend making an MVP and <laughs> go out and raise money. Um, it's a much slower journey for those of us in biotech because there's the regulatory process, which takes many years, um, as well as in our case, ingredients that are alive. So biomanufacturing is something people don't really think about, but has really come into the public consciousness and the zeitgeist as we think about these vaccines, um, the COVID vaccines. Um, so when we started, um, and I think this is something that'll be different, I've, I've noticed with tech startups versus biotech is there's a bit of a chicken and egg problem with getting your first funding. The chicken and egg be, is a problem because it's really hard to build um, a prototype or some sort of um, proof of principle without having significant funding. And it's hard to get significant funding without some sort of proof of concept. Um, so academia becomes a really good place to incubate your technologies as long as possible. Um, but I think more than um, with regular, you know, 
with traditional tech, um, biotech really benefits from the SBIR program from the, the federal government. So for those of you who don't know what those are, um, especially for deep tech companies, and biotech clearly is one of those, um, the SBIR program stands for Small Business Innovation Research Dollars. And this is free, non-dilutive funding from the government that um, you know Google started out with, with SBIR funding, many tech companies do, um, but it allows you to get some free money so you can tell investors, and this is what we did for our first friends and family round, that we've got funding from the government that's been from a very through through a very rigorous peer review process. So it, it comes with that. Um, and on the heels of that, we raised, you know, I think our first SBIR grant was 200K, but we raised 4 million of outside angel capital um, in, in, in a way as kind of uh, on the heels of that. And, um, and so that, you know, that kind of solved our chicken and egg problem, getting that SBIR funding. And then it all became about executing. And um, one of our investors who's been with us since the very beginning um, gave me a compliment that I, I just want to share because I think it shows what my value system is because it resonated with me so much. He said, look, Nina, I love working with you guys because you're low drama. You always say you're going to do something and then we check in six months later and lo and behold, there's not a bunch of yes buts. Um, there's a bunch of progress and um, and, and I, I like I take that as a compliment to me. It's actually a compliment to the team. <laughs> but, you know, I play my role in that and I like the idea that um, we're starting to build a reputation for ourselves as people that are pretty good at predicting our capabilities. Um, you know, when we think, you know, hey, we can grow no cartilage to know that we can and to speak with truth about that so that we can predict the budgets, the timelines um, that allow us to kind of um, be low drama. Um, that to me is very good. It means that we understand our capabilities, we understand our blind spots, and that we, um, both of those are really important. And actually the blind spots, I think, is even more important um, to, um, you know, minimize the drama from the outside world. So, um, yeah, I think the team has has is got a lot of capability. We've got a deep bench on the science, and um, and we've been able to now build start to build a reputation with our investors. And then what that's led to is that good people always lead you to good people. Um, I've met wonderful people through Erica specifically, um, and um, and so then it just keeps going on. And if you're consistent and you show up every day to that marathon. Um, after 10 years, eventually, you know, there is some consistency to that discipline of showing up every day um, with a positive attitude and doing the work starts to pay off. So um, we've met wonderful investors all through our current syndicate. Yeah. I, I mean, love how overnight success generally takes about 10 years to, to <laughs> get. <laughs> I was literally about to hit that because I think that we don't speak on that enough that yeah. it is truly a process that, you know, social media kind of just shows the end result, but the reality <laughs> is that it takes a lot of work. You, you know, you have to find, like you said, for your instance, is the free money to kind of let that be the dangling carrot to the money that you need it to come in. Um, so it's a lot of intention, a lot of strategy and a lot of days, right? And a lot of ask, a lot of ask, so. <laughs> Well, one yeah. of the things I loved about this story that I think is applicable to everybody else, you know, regardless of what type of company they have, and sadly, we're definitely not all el eligible for SBIRs, but right. you know, I look at your SBIR grant as a really critical signaling investment, right? So mm -hmm. even though it was only 200,000, you know, it was the signal you needed to get the remaining 4 million. Yeah. And I think that that's really applicable to any startup or person who's raising money. Um, that sometimes there can be investors who come in maybe with a smaller amount, but you know, their signal is priceless to you in terms of getting other people on board. Yeah, I think that's really sound advice. Um, and, and, you know, SBIR program really is more um, for deep tech. So if they're, you know, so they're, if they're, generally it's not for software based companies, but hardware and biotech. And, but the real benefit is that signal that, that being able to show at an early stage that you're, that you understand of the concept of de-risking um, and the kind of, I don't want to say herd mentality, because that's something that sounds like um, not a positive thing, but the fact that people learn from each other's experience and one person having 
that peer review process for SBIR or pretend that it's a, a well-known angel group. You know, that's also um, a similar thing. You know, being able to show to your future portfolio, um, you know, those companies will benefit from saying, look, we went through the rigorous process for Rain Ventures, and then people understand that builds credibility, and then those founders can then continue on. And, and in our case, it was SBIR funding, but you could substitute a well-known angel group, um, leveraging your alumni networks from, you know, wherever you're graduating out of or wherever other people on your team have. Um, but getting that, solving that chicken and egg problem is, um, is, is, is really the key. And um, in our case, it was non-dilutive funding. It doesn't have to be. Yeah. And so, you know, you've gone on and raised additional money, you know, mm -hmm. outside of your first seed round. What do you think were the biggest lessons learned from the process of managing an investor pipeline and, you know, getting your series A done? I think, I think that almost a customer service mindset is helpful. I mean, when I think back to some of the jobs where I learned the most, um, I was a receptionist in a doctor's office for a, a few summers. And it was a very difficult job because you can imagine patients that are waiting to see the doctor are usually not happy there. Um, and they don't like to be kept waiting. It was a great lesson for me to answer the phone, help triage those people coming in and recognize what it's like to be in customer service. And I think that that type of mentality really transfers over to investor relations and investor outreach, treating every single person like they are the most important person in the world because they are, um, whether, you know, is, is just the right way to be, it feels good, um, but also it tends to bring out the best in those other people and then the good people lead you to good people. So, um, you know, I think learning that, 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 that high touch type of intuition that we, that I had for life and um, Blake, who I mentioned before had come from a background in real estate and luxury goods. Both of those are examples of um, very high touch interactions. Um, you know, I think that background really came in handy. Um, and then, you know, what else would I say about investors? You know, at the fact that we're very transparent you know, we come from a scientific background, you publish your research, you're proud of that, you're proud to share and show what you what you do. Um, that type of mentality has also transferred really well to um, the diligence process for prospective investors, as well as the investor relations once they're on our cap table. Um, we have a reputation for being very transparent um, being very open and upfront with what we're dealing with. Uh, our COVID newsletters were an example of that, just really looping people into our thought process. And that's something that, you know, came through our upbringing in, in the academic context, but um, I think is, is something that has, has really aided us in not only going through diligence with prospective investors, but working with them once they're um, in the Effiebone family, as we call them. That's great. Um, Monique, do you have a question? I know we have a question from the audience. So I was going to say that Donald Robinson II has asked a question. So I was just going to ask you, Nina. He says, Nina, have you gotten any positive reception in terms of funding from R&D resources, traditional and tech related? So I would say, you know, when we think about strategic investors, um, we thought about our eventual customers. And we thought about eventual acquirers as kind of two different buckets um, or companies where we are customers of theirs. <laughs> so, um, you know, in terms of strategic investment that we've gotten, um, we've gotten um, uh, professional athletes as, to, on our cap table, you know, involved. Erica actually was really helpful with that effort. Um, these are the high performance individuals that are going to eventually use, need their joints replaced and don't want it made out of metal. Um, and we got money from the Department of Defense because soldiers are also in that category. And um, the one that I think is really interesting is getting a hospital system to invest. So Hackensack Meridian is New Jersey's largest hospital, and they have made um, regenerative medicine one of the pushes for them as 
an entity. Um, so while it hasn't been R&D dollars exactly from the hospital that you could say, you know, they invested in our company, um, but I would say that that's the closest example of um, a strategic investor where our R&D interests aligned with theirs. In the future, we're also considering biopharma companies um, as a, or device companies as potential areas where we could collaborate in an R&D fashion with a strategic investor. And we are always open to introductions if anyone's got any. We've been at, working on a few active leads in that, in that category. So it seems like you're super strategic and kind of like creatively thinking outside the box to have the conversations where they matter, right? Oh, or, yeah. Where they're easier. And yeah, I, I tell I, founders yeah, that totally. all the time, you know. I talk, love that you said that. Yeah, because I think it's, I think it should be, you know, something that we put a little more energy into um, mm -hmm. when we're raising funds, talking to the people that actually make sense, right? And mm -hmm. to kind of relieve the stress from both sides. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if they want to see if there's something in their worldview, the world they want to see overlaps with the world I want to see, we can be friends. Let's right. do it together, you know, and, um, you know, when you said what you said, you reminded me one of my favorite classes in business school <laughs> was called systematic creativity, which sounds like an oxymoron, but was um, was a class that I loved so much and also ended up TAing, um, where you would say you just ask a question to like, who do we work with? Who's gonna be a customer of ours? Who are we gonna be a customer of in this five years in the future? And then use that kind of systematic way to that method to uncover ideas you wouldn't have had. Um, so you don't have to just be a creative person, whatever that is, to have creative ideas. Right. Oftentimes it's just about framing a question and then you just start filling in the answers and you start your, you start thinking in ways you didn't expect. So. Um, so thank you for pointing that out. It's, I think no, I it's super it. obvious with you. I actually over appreciate it. I relate to it. <laughs> and I wish that we celebrated it more. I think that creativity has been kind of left in one space of like the entertainment world or right. the creation of like a music or something. The reality is that in order to make it as a founder, we have to be super creative from a business perspective, um, time and time again. And especially as you scale your business or your fundraising, you have to continue to be creative because each person you're talking to is going to require a different conversation. God bless. You know, I think, I think that really is a mantra for me because, you know, you hit, you know, you're in, they always say runway, which implies that a startup is a plane. Um, but I often think of a startup like a boat <laughs> and like, you know, don't let it sink. <laughs> don't let it sink. And what are those lifeboats and how much turbulence are you going to hit? And, you know, you learn a lot about yourself when there's a global pandemic and you're a new mom and you're pregnant and you're trying to figure out how do you keep all your babies alive and well, and EpiBone is my firstborn. Yep. And, and, um, and I have two human kids after that, but, um, it's very much a mentality of what's, what's in, you know, you, if you eat as much planning as you do, and believe me, we do, because we have a 10 year plan that we revisit every year, um, in detail, <laughs> but, um, we also, I think have some of that, um, you know, nimbleness that comes from kind of a scrappy upbringing you know grad students like me we used to just troll around for free pizza we we <laughs> can be scrappy and um and that i think has has contributed to our resiliency yeah you learn a lot about yourself in difficult times it's um well, you know, I uh, need to check out that class. I don't remember this class. Uh, when I was in Columbia. Maybe I can audit it online or something. I I'd join like you. Something that I need um, and that you would be a great TA for. I was like a TA for like something boring statistics, nothing cool, <laughs> like systematic creativity. That sounds really cool. Um, so we do have a question from Durand who asks, what was your particular process for coming up with the $4 million investment number for your series A? I do want to point out the 4 million was her series seed. And then you did a series A, I guess, prior to the pandemic, right? So we yeah. So actually this is a good moment because, um, you know, we haven't taken a traditional fundraising path. And um, in part, it was because we were kind of new to the game. Um, but our first round of funding was 4 million of all convertible notes. 
Um, and we actually did a couple of rounds of convertible notes with different caps. Um, and we had raised you know, more than $10 million that way. Yeah. Um, we didn't do our first equity round until uh, last, well, a year ago, January, that was our series seed. Um, and we're planning our series A now. So we've put 25 million in the bank of, um, of well, three, let's say 22 million of, of investor money, 3 million of non-dilutive grants um, with, on, with our, but we pushed off that first equity round and, and hence valuation on that equity round until we'd had some time to progress. Um, and, um, you know, I mentioned the value of the SBIR and the value of the Columbia community, which was huge for us. We met um, two amazing family offices who were executive because they were executives and residents at Columbia. Um, but also, I had the good fortune to be selected a TED fellow the um, year that we launched our company. So I had a chance to give a talk at TED. Um, I got to talk right before Bill Gates. You know, I opened for How him. How have I not seen um, your TED talk yet? You're I don't know. Yes, that. Nina, you are a rock star girl. You <laughs> um, but that was a really good launching point for us because it gave me a chance to talk about these really academic concepts. I mean, growing body parts out of cells. I mean, I, I didn't think that could ever really reach a wide audience. And, um, you know, a million people more watch those videos and it's really served as a way for us to um, just get our ideas out into the zeitgeist and and people at TED were also very much funders of our first round. It was basically all Tedsters and Columbia Business School. Um, and, and then it morphed from there because good people always lead you to good people. I love that. I love that. That's amazing. So the secret to startup fundraising is do an awesome TED talk. <laughs> See, I heard something different, right? I heard you got uncomfortable. You put yeah. yourself out there. You were doing speaking engagements based on the knowledge of the business that you were building. You just weren't selling the business yet, but you were selling, you were setting the foundation of the problem. And I think that that can go a long way with our founders in easing up feeling like immediately they have to pitch the business versus no. really selling themselves as who they are as the founder and why they're a great founder first, you know? Yeah. The, um, one of our, one of my favorite advisors is, um, Hank Kutchman, who's one of the, who's the former CEO of Boston Scientific. And, um, he's also a surfer and a yogi. So we're simpatico in that sense. Um, but he always says, you know, you bet on the jockey, you know, of, in the horse race and, um, and, you know, a good jockey is going to ride a good horse. You know, the team is for me, the team is everything. But if I'm not good with that team, if that's not a good fit, we're toast. So, you know, like my co-founder, Ick, we call him Ick. It's like Nick without the N. Um, his name is Sarinj Bumaratana. He's Thai and everyone in Thailand gets a nickname. So his nickname is Ick. He and I have been working together since 2006, you know, and I, one of the other favorite classes that I've had a chance to, you know, guest lecture in, not really take, is um, with family businesses at CBS, at the, the business school. And one thing I love about family businesses is that they outperform the market consistently. Usually the third generation will sometimes make some mistakes, um, but, you know, the parents and grandparents, you know, when you have a family business, and I think we have certain aspects of a family business, we have long-term relationships, I've been working with my co-founder for 15 plus years, my PhD advisor, who I've been working with for almost 20 years, um, my best friend from high school, who I've known for close to 30 years, um, <laughs> right? You know, and, and other people on the team have also been working together for a very long time. Our, one of our engineers I went to undergrad with and he became BFFs with my co-founder. So we're talking long-term relationships, a huge amount of trust, on this team. And so we have certain weeks where everyone is firing on all cylinders and the job is really to keep everyone coordinated, but there is, it's hard to overstate how important it is to have that kind of trust. And sometimes that can be built quickly, but when you see a team where a lot of people have known each other for a long time, that also means they're good at solving interpersonal relationship issues. And we've invested quite a lot in that. I think that's something that really sets us apart as well. Um, so we have a tight-knit team. We don't leave it to chance. We, we incorporate 
leadership coaching in pair settings as well as in individual settings. I do couples therapy with my co-founder and with my <laughs> chief of staff. And because of that, we're investing in relationships so that we're not on the other side of it doing remedial coaching, remedial, you know, problem solving. We are trying to stay ahead of it. And, um, and I think we have pretty, you know, my team might say otherwise, but I think we have pretty healthy interpersonal dynamics, which is, um, I think, a huge part of a technical challenge that often gets overlooked. There are humans building those robots. Let's make sure those humans work well together. You know, I love that a healthy, a healthy company. I healthy like to think company. of ourselves as being inspired by biology in the way we think about our organization. Our organization is like an organism. We have, we talk about diversity of phenotypes in the body, like neuron skin and muscle. We need, every organization also needs different phenotypes. So there's that analogy runs deep for me. No, it does. And, and it's so, it's always been important and relative, right? But now is the time of the big conversation constantly. So we, we tell um, founders to always think of inclusivity from the ground up, not yeah. just as their team, but also as their customer and their potential customer and their potential partners and their potential investors, right? Everything should look inclusive. I agree. Um, it just makes business sense. I mean, when I look at companies, when they come to me in it for advice, I ask them, what are the demographics of your target market? All right. And what are the demographics of your leadership? If there's a mismatch there, mm, not so much, not so much. And, um, and that's just, you know, setting yourselves up for a really big blind spot. Who wants to do that? You know? Absolutely. Well, we have you another know, question, Erica. What? We, uh, and I'm believing I'm saying this correctly. And, and these, and Disa, and Disa says, this is a great business. Which healthcare markets do you service outside of the United States? And how similar or different are these markets? So our first product is bone. We're taking, um, we're growing fully customized bone and our clinical trials are all here in the US because that is where we are. Um, the US, however, is a great launching pad from a regulatory perspective for worldwide markets. That's another great reason to start here. So we've been looking at international expansion once we get that first clinical trial under our belt. So in about two years time, um, what that means is we are very actively working to recruit um, strategic investors in those locations, um, as well as um, tapping the network of our investors who can help us. So that's very much an active area for us. Um, especially as we start getting into those pivotal trials. There's also really interesting end markets that are very different for the rest of world versus the US. And I'll just give you one example. Um, rhinoplasty, which is um, you know, uh, um, plastic surgery for the nose, looks very different in the US versus Asia. Um, in the US, oftentimes a rhinoplasty procedure involves trimming down the nose um, because of the way that the, you know, the, the aesthetics, the, the, the standards of beauty and how they are interpreted in this environment are very different um, than in Asia where oftentimes rhinoplasty means building that nose up. Um, so you can imagine the implant market for rhinoplasty may not exist in the US, but is infinite in other parts of the world. So if you don't take a global perspective, when you think about the body, um, you're probably going to have some blind spots. So we, we really do try and, um, and think about that, you know, what are the demographics of joint replacement in the US? How much do those assumptions apply in other countries? Um, and um, certain diseases like, and I'll give you one more example, um, because Bill Gates actually asked me about this one. In my one meeting, I had a chance to talk <laughs> with him about you Name remember these off. things, you know? <laughs> and um, so there's a disease. So, so Bill Gates is, has been very, you know, focused on infectious diseases for a long time. And malaria is a disease that's very common in, um, you know, Africa, but not as common here in the U.S. So in, in the U.S., it's considered an orphan disease because it doesn't affect that many people and therefore gets underinvested in and you have this downstream problem. Now, there's a condition called avascular necrosis as well, which is a disease of the bone um, that leads to an under nourishment of that bone via, you know, avascular, meaning the blood supply is not there. Necrosis, the, the tissue dies. And it's a pretty rare condition here in the US, 
but is a pretty common condition in parts of the world with high HIV because it's an unintended side effect of long-term um, you know, uh, HIV medication use. And so I told him, I would love to work on this condition. It sort of looks a lot like malaria um, because it's a common condition in Africa um, and other parts of the world, but I was specifically you know, trying to think about the Gates Foundation um, and is less common here. And, um, and he got it. But what he said is, you know, get through that first clinical trial and let's talk again. So fast forward eight years, um, and um, I hope to, to to revisit that because, you know, my background comes from a, you know, my my father's from India, my mom's from the U.S., her parents came from Austria. You know, it's to me like I have cousins all over the world, and um, the idea that clinical trials have had biases in them in terms of the diversity of people in them. The idea that um, personalized medicine may not be, um, you know, may be considered something that's too um, posh for the rest of the world, you know, and ends up creating inequality amongst people who can afford treatment and who can't. That stuff eats me alive and keeps me up at night. I would like to see a world where personalized medicine is actually more affordable because it is, um, you know, mass customization doesn't have to be more expensive than, um, you know, scalable production of any other variety. Um, so that is the world I care about. You know, people ask me a lot about bioethics, um, especially with stem cells, and they're usually talking about designer babies. Um, and I, and we sidestep those issues because we're using adult stem cells, not controversial. However, the most important bioethical consideration from my view is healthcare um, equity. And making sure that we're not creating a product that is approvable but not affordable and i don't want to make a product that's only um you know <laughs> where only parts of the world can afford it and others can't um it's a personal mission of mine but it's an ethos that i think a lot of scientists share we don't want to just make it build a technology that's only for the privileged few wow that's amazing yeah, I mean, that's so inspiring to hear and, you know, completely consistent with what, you know, I've learned from knowing you for the last few years. And, you know, I think it's amazing to see folks like yourself building companies that are solving real problems in the world and making sure that you can solve them uh, sort of for the, for the greatest number of people. Um, so I just want to let everyone know we're coming down to sort of the end of our time. Um, if you have questions that you'd like answered by the wonderful Nina, uh, please be sure to put them in the chat and we'll get them answered for you. Um, and, you know, as sort of a final question before we open it up again to, to folks um, in the audience, you know, what can you tell us um, is your biggest learning um, from bringing on investors that, you know, may or may not have been uh, folks that are the most aligned with your vision. So, you know, when you talk a little bit about your uh, very ethical stance to growing the business and to how you price your product and, you know, sort of extract value from this creation, you know, have you dealt with some challenges around maybe investors that are a little bit more, you know, driven um, from a monetary perspective? Well, you know, we've hit some speed bumps along the way. So, you know, while I haven't I can't say that I have investors that have been problems for us. There's certainly been a, a, an amount. If, if I'd gotten through seven years with zero conflict, I'm not sure I'd be doing a good job either um, in terms of boldness. Um, so there have been a, a couple of times, you know, especially, um, you know, when we were first dealing with the FDA and, and trying to figure out how to interpret the, um, you know, the letters in response that we would get from our applications, you could imagine there was some stress around that. We've never had investors who were activists in the sense that they, um, you know, made made noise or in any or try or gotten our way. Um, but there, you know, there have been situations where you know, I've tapped uh, investors of mine for advice. Um, you know, you've been one of those people, Erica. I think um, other one person that really stands out is um, is Henry Kravis, who is an angel investor, but we asked him after a while, can we put you as an advisor too? Because he actually is there when I've had to have difficult conversations. And, um, and one of the reasons why he's been a wonderful investor for us is that when you're noodling on a difficult question, you know you're going to get really good advice, but you also know that that's going to be advice that becomes more actionable because he has the kind of stature to then try and build a coalition around. 
Um, so if I get advice, if I'm dealing with something difficult, a difficult question, I oftentimes go to people like him, get their thoughts, and then start to figure out, well, who else who else do I need to get on board in order for this to happen and really sequence um, that, that, that coalition building. Um, Cause we have, you know, we have quite a few angel investors. So I have to sort of, I have to think about building consensus. Consensus doesn't mean unanimity. <laughs> We're, unanimous is unattainable and is probably means you're aiming too low. Um, but being able to kind of um, digest and be able to be comfortable outside of the comfort zone of, um, unconditional love from every direction um, has been very helpful. Um, I've definitely been able to, over the years, metabolize more conflict than I, I've been able to do in the past. I think that one's a really key learning for me is that it doesn't always have to be comfortable. You can be uncomfortable sometimes for months at a time. And you learn a lot about yourself when you figure out how do I deal with a situation that I can't control. and um, the predisposition to take action when you know you can't, just being able to sit and stew in difficulty. I think that's what people mean when they say grit. Um, but I think that's been something that I have developed over the years is um, a thicker skin. Now it hasn't gotten rid of my positivity. Like I just, like I said, I drank the Kool-Aid, it's running through my veins. Like I, it's like, I am the Kool-Aid, you know? I believe in what we're doing so much that um, that is a source of energy for me. But dealing with conflict, I, I go to my advisors and I try and figure out what's the right answer because their perspectives can be really helpful. And then how do I build on that right answer by building coalitions around that and using that to take action? I hope that's helpful. Was that a bit rambly? Oh, no, <laughs> I mean, that's incredibly helpful. And, you know, we know how hard it is to deal emotionally with challenges. And, you know, I think 99% of leadership is, as you said, you know, learning how to sit with discomfort, um, mm -hmm. but still maintain a positive outlook and, and move forward in your mission. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's that positive people. mindset. Yes. Yeah. Oh, thank you. You know, thank you so much. Um, Eric and I get to do this once a month and it's always amazing to be reminded of why we do this and how important it is um, for us to do this and to have these conversations and to share information and to celebrate founders at, such as yourself and, and the journey. Um, and today we heard about a 10 plus year journey, which is amazing. Um, so these conversations are important. And um, I'm just excited. I'm excited for you and what, and what you're doing. I'm excited for science. My sister was born disabled with spina bifida. Oh, so uh, yeah, so this is like, this is like the ongoing conversation. So it's, what you're doing is amazing. It will change people's lives. Well, that's the mission. We have every intention of helping the world be a better place through this work. And and I just, I just want to thank both of you um, for this opportunity to chat and think about some deep questions, but, but also for the work you're doing um, really to try and change the ecosystem of investment out there. It's a key, you know, it's not enough for founders to, to be founding companies. We have to think about who is investing in them, recruiting investors that haven't been involved in the ecosystem before, all that work to you know, it's, it's good work and founders like me are so grateful that you are taking up the mantle. Oh, thank you, Nina. And, you know, I just want to say that, you know, echo Monique sentiments, um, not only, you know, are we so blessed to know you and have had, you know, a wonderful opportunity to interact with you today and in the past and support what you're building with EpiBone. Um, but we're so grateful for you sharing your story, you know, sharing your energy and inspiring other founders um, to, you know, adopt some of the amazing qualities that you've been able to bring to your business and your journey. Uh, so, you know, thank you for that. I know that that it's a lot. And, uh, you know, every time we do one of these um, episodes, I think it really reminds Monique and I how lucky we are to have built relationships with, you know, founders who are so super talented, 
um, but are really creating amazing things in the world. And, you know, it's not just about building a billion dollar company, um, but it's really about, you know, building amazing things um, and building a better future for all of us. So thank you for that, Nina. Thank you both so much, really. It's been, it was a joy to chat. I, it's, thank you so much. And Keep doing what you're doing. We need you <laughs> out there. Yeah, I, I want you to know that because you were speaking and we were asking you questions, but the audience has really appreciated your authenticity, mm -hmm. your inspiration, and um, your feedback on how to invest, how to be strategic, how to creatively think outside the box. So thank you because they were commenting the whole time. So Aww, they really did appreciate. Wonderful. Yes, they appreciate you. It's, it's we do. <laughs> thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. So. And um, so I just want to remind everybody, you know, go on YouTube and Google Nina's TED Talk. We, we can all watch that tonight and get <laughs> a thumbs up and some additional views. And I also want to remind everybody joining in live today that if you go to our YouTube channel, uh, you'll actually find uh, all the previous episodes that we've done to date. This is episode seven. So if you'd like to see more Series A list, uh, check us out on YouTube and thank you for joining. Thank you.